Disney. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's see. Any announcements we need to make at this time? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, just want to make everybody aware we're going to be having our business meeting this coming Wednesday night, and I encourage everyone to be here. Uh, there's a lot on the agenda. Uh, first off, uh, we're going to be uh, our income expense reports for the last four months. We're going to need to go ahead and take care of those and get those approved. Uh, Ms. BJ is uh, she's back working on those, and we're thankful for that. Thankful that she's been able to get to the point she could do that. So. We'll be presenting those to the church Wednesday night. We'll also be confirming a new trustee. We need an additional trustee here at the church. We have two, but we need a, a third to operate as we should. Uh, also, there's been a lot of questions about the parking across the road here and everything, and the pastor uh, is no longer using it. He's gotten all his things out. I've had a lot of people question me about it, and uh, we want to discuss what direction we're going to go with by way of the parsonage there. Uh, we've got some things we'd like to bring forth to the church and I'd like for everyone to, uh, concerned about any of these issues and maybe some other things because it's gonna be a busy night. I just encourage everyone to come out and join us and uh, help us decide what we need to do. Thank you. Any other announcements? Ms. Carroll. That's not really an announcement, but yesterday, as well, we had a Mother's State get together, which was excellent. And uh, miss miss the ones that had signed up. I understand a few of you were sick, and uh, we, we sure did miss you. And the ones that did not get there was missed. But the ladies that were there, I think that they will back me up. It was probably one of the the better ones, and um, it was just a wonderful time in the Lord. Our speaker is on fire for the Lord, and, and she did a good job. But I got to send out a, a praise shout. When I started talking to Debbie about what the Lord had laid on my heart to do with this, because we didn't do a whole lot on Mother's Day before, so this was to, you know, to kind of take care of a little bit more. So we had planned over the telephone and in person, you know, what we wanted to do, but then everything came down with, with Lori being so sick, and, and then I lost the, uh, the surveyor there in the office that was under with Bobby, and... Uh, uh, that was we had his memorial this week. So I've been a lot going on in my life and a lot of heartache. And uh, if it had not been, and Debbie's not here, Michael is. But if it had not been for Miss Irene and uh, Debbie stepping up and doing what they did, we probably would have had to cancel it. So I just want to thank them from the bottom of my heart. I did yesterday, but you know, working together when one can't do it or or two can't do it, there's a group. And that's the way these women work together to make it all. But everybody that didn't get there, <laughs> we miss you. And uh, but uh, I thank and, and the other thing, and I'm gonna hush. I thank you for what you did this past week with your music. It was absolutely beautiful. Our pastor could not be a better pastor, y'all, as far as taking care of the church, but also taking care of you when you get sick. He's always on the phone and he's always coming to see us. And uh, bless his heart, the first one Lori Ann had, had attended right by himself. <laughs> Johnny was up in the room because she had told him to go there. And so I kept talking to him, but I was kind of ashamed of that. But uh, he showed up on the other, but and I'm all sure to mean it. There's a lot. <laughs> I talked to the doctor this morning about her and uh, they had, cannot do the surgery tomorrow. And we'll let you know, he said it could be as much as a week before the swelling goes down in that arm that they can go back in again. There is no infection for that, but she is working with uh, uh, infectious disease doctors, there's a whole group of them. And um, nothing was broken, and praise the Lord for that, but that blood clot was on the move, and they had to tend to it fast, or, or he told me, or Lori Ann, well, we're not even going to get there. Her hands had already turned black on that side. She laid on the arm too long. That was what caused, uh, before they got to it, she was on the floor talon and picked her up. She was on her arm for about 30 minutes, and he said that was actually what had uh, started the process. So, but the long story here, it is not over. 
Uh, they may move her on to rehab, uh, to work on her there, and then carry her back to the hospital for more surgery. So it's just a matter of what happens this week. He said, we just, we're really going to watch her, take care of her here, and we'll see what happens. So that's where, but thank everybody for praying. And Stephanie, I want to tell you, honey, you did a good job. Thank you. All right, any other announcements? All right, how about birthdays? Anybody have a birthday? <coughs> You can come up any time you want to. I'll start eating everything. You know, it's time to think of me. At your age, yeah. at your age, you can come up anytime you're able, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to wait to shoot you because it might not be here. Right. Well, tell us how old you are. I'll be 82. 82. How about that? I think it's for, I don't think I'm that old. <laughs> we need to consult with your wife to see how All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Feeling your age, huh? <laughs> All right. Wedding anniversaries. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. When is it? Today. Today? 30 days. 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> It's easy to mix up those numbers, but it does matter. So. All right. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. All right. Well. We want to get to a more serious note now and talk about prayer requests. And I know mm -hmm. Carolyn's already told us about Lori. So, uh, anyone else have a prayer request? I don't have a prayer request, but I have a um, Most of y'all probably know I had a hip replacement on the 26th of April. And I just want to thank everybody for your cards and your calls and your messages. And, and uh, I want to thank God for my husband. We've been married 28 years, and I never would have thought that he'd have to do some of the things that he has done for me these past two weeks. But y'all know David. He's a little surfer dude, and nothing it just flows right off his back. It, nothing bothers him. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on him. He's washed my hair. <laughs> he has shaved my legs. <laughs> he painted my toenails last night. <laughs> Yeah, he's not even turning red back then. Not even turning red. No, that's not the end of the list, but that's where I'm cutting it. Um, but no, I just want to let you I just, I really appreciate my husband. I just, uh, he has cooked for me. He's made me eat. Y'all, I never thought somebody had to make me eat. But. Pain meds take your appetite, and they're not fun. I don't have people get stuck on them, to be honest with you, because it just was not good. But um, and he had all my medications laid out. But I just want to thank him. He, he's been a, he's a jewel. But first and foremost, I want to thank my Lord. I want to thank you all for your prayers, because if it wasn't for that, I would not be sitting here doing as well as I am doing today. So thank you very much. I appreciate you, and I love you all. Anyone else? Without fail. Oh, okay. 
So last weekend on the 12th, my friend got in a car accident and she passed away. Her name is, um, last name's Kinlaw. She was 17 years old. She, um, she hit a concrete block and then it killed her on the way back. She was 17 years old and we were just going to there best friend. We just asked for prayer and comfort for her family because it was her mother's only child. Special need there, for sure. Anyone else with prayer request? When I failed, I broke my nose, and I have surgery tomorrow. Thank you for your prayers. Robin, I fear for Christ. I would just like for you to remember my mom. She's been diagnosed with COVID. All those special needs. Anyone else? Raise your hand so we can see who you are. Anybody back here? All right. Well, if not, we're going to go to the Okay, we're at. Raise your hand. All right. Okay. Let's see. Appreciate y'all's prayer for my granddaughter. I mean, she reason why she had a blood issue. It is leukemia. She's 26 years old in Florida. She works for Disney, Walt Disney down there. <clears throat> Just uh, pray that things will go well. I hand that right over to Mr. Barry and ask him, we're going to ask him to have the prayer for us this time. Right. Just say so what I'm saying, Lord. And I didn't know that until uh, the doctor told her. She's on a COVID floor, which the COVID patients is that way and she's this way. So there's a lot of construction going on. She's on the eighth floor, but that's really concerning me too. So, you know, everybody going in one room and coming in, so we decided we all gonna double up on masks. So just be praying, because she does not need that. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just uh, we want to thank you now again for this most beautiful day you've given us, God. We thank you for the church we have to come to and to just worship and praise you, God. And we just so much to be thankful for, Lord, and each and every prayer request we've heard this morning and praise reports, God. We know that you've got it all covered, Lord God. We know that you're in control of all things, Lord. As crazy as our world looks right now, God, we do know that you're in control, and we just thank you, God, for that, Lord. And we just lift up each and every one this morning, the caregivers especially. We know caregiving can be a hard job, and we know, God, that you'll be, we'll be with the caregivers, Lord, nurses, doctors. It all comes from you, Lord God, and I just pray that your spirit fill this house this morning, God, and, and just move amongst us as we open your word, God, and, and just praise you in all ways. And all these things we pray in the most wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, let's all stand together and say <laughs> When the morning comes, 522, if you want to look in your book.
here this morning. But the lady that brought this song to us is sitting right here. And I heard she did some mighty fine singing yesterday. I heard. She did. Amen. So she brought us this song, so we're going to let her help us sing this song. You heard her talk? Um, you're right there, sir. You're, you're fine. You feel like you're on the spot. Me too. We'll talk about that. Here we go. Thank you. 
beautiful song, beautiful words. Well, I want to welcome you once again, uh, those in our fellowship hall and those watching us on Facebook Live. We appreciate you joining in with us today. I pray that the Lord will give us something all that, that we all can use in our life, and I'm sure it is. In fact, today's message is entitled Peace in the Midst of Turmoil. So what an appropriate song to lead us into the message, amen? Peace in the midst of turmoil. Let's turn to Judges chapter 10, verses 1 through 5. We're going to learn through the life of two men, uh, two judges rather, uh, how they were able to keep peace in the midst of turmoil. And I hope that we can learn from that as well. Judges 10, 1 through 5. And this is what the scripture says. And after Abimelech, there arose to defend Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Ishikar, and he dwelt in Shemir in Mount Ephraim. And he judged Israel twenty and three years and died and was buried in Shemir. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel twenty and two years. And he had thirty sons that rode on thirty ass colts, and they had thirty cities which are called Havoth Jair unto this day which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Kema. Let's pray. Never the Father, we ask your blessings now upon the, the reading of your holy and precious word, upon the message of this hour. May we glean from it what we need. May the Holy Spirit impress upon us, Father, for our daily walk with you, what would help us to maintain peace in the midst of turmoil. And Father, if there's any listening today without Christ, I pray that this would be the day they will come to salvation. We give you the glory to praise. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Now, way back before this time we're speaking of in the scripture, there was a man called Moses. You may remember him. And he led the children of Israel out of Egypt and all through the wilderness. But then Moses died and Joshua come in his stead. And he become the leader of the nation of Israel for quite a while. And Joshua was able to lead them into the promised land. But when Joshua and all his generation died out, so did the allegiance of the nation of Israel to God. They began to emulate all of the surrounding neighbors of theirs, the heathen nations in worshiping false idols and false gods. And when this happened, the Lord would become angry with them. And he would oppress them by allowing them to become captive into other nations, Philistines in particular. And so this went on. They would straighten up for a while and they would go bad for a while. They would straighten up for a while and they would go bad for a while. Before Israel had a king, they had what was known a series of people who become judges, leaders of the nation of Israel. God used these men and these women to save the Israelites from out of the oppression of their enemies and lead them in peaceful times. And then it seemed like once a judge died, the people would go right back into their wicked ways. So God would allow them to be oppressed once again until they repented of their sin and turned back to him. Now, a few of the judges are well known. Judges such as Deborah, Gideon, or maybe even Samson. The Bible tells us that as soon as Gideon had died, the people of Israel were led by his son, by a concubine, a man named Abimelech, who led the people astray and in wicked ways. In fact, this Abimelech, to make sure his seat upon the throne was secure, had all 70 sons of Gideon killed at one time. Just had them murdered. And so that would allow him to be the leader without any competition of the nation of Israel. But he led Israel in ways that were wicked. By the time Elimelech is dead, it, the nation of Israel is left in tatters from a civil war from within themselves. 
As a result of all their problems, the nation of Israel has become quite a mess. This was the nation that rather two obscure judges took over. The names we have just read, Tola and Jair. And so the nation of Israel is such a mess when they took over. But we're going to learn that they were able to keep peace in the midst of turmoil. Just how bad were the days in which these two judges lived? Well, there's two different verses that say the exact same thing. In Judges 17, verse 6, and in Judges 21, verse 25, this is what it says. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. When we do things that's right in our own eyes and do not even consider what might be right in God's eyes, then we're headed for trouble. And our life's going to become a mess. Now, would you not agree with me that our nation, the one we call America, is in a mess today? Amen. I have never seen such as what we are seeing today in the times in which we live. Even in the days in which we live, our churches are in a mess. Now think about it. Most everyone around us is looking for something new or looking for something better to add or change to the church. There always seems to be a new book coming out or maybe a new study, How to Grow Your Church. This has been going on for decades. Every so often something new comes out. Let's grow your church in this manner. It all changes. I believe Christians will grow the church the way it's always been. By letting your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Christians need to live for the Lord even when others around us are living for the world and all that it offers. That's what Joseph did. Joseph, the coat of many colors, he was taken out of his home, away from his family, into a strange land that worships false idols, and he maintained his faith in the one true God. That's the way Daniel did it. Daniel kept his faith in God, even though all the people around him were serving false idols. And I believe you and I can do that in the midst of where we are at, in the midst of the people we come in contact with. Many folks say, well, it's hard to be a Christian on the job site. No, it's not. You simply quit following the lead of others around you and you follow the lead of Jesus Christ. Amen. Allow him to lead you and guide you in your heart. I believe Christians need to walk in the Lord even when others are walking their own way and forsaking God. That's what Enoch did. He didn't walk with God. He didn't walk not for God. Took him up because he was so close to him in the way he lived. I believe Christians need to go where people are and invite them to come to Christ instead of waiting in the church and putting a sign up and saying, oh, come on in. That's what Paul did. Paul went to where they were and he witnessed to them and he won many of them to Christ. And you and I need to follow the example of the Apostle Paul. In light of the chaos we find in our lives every day, it's not hard to come to the conclusion that our world is in a mess. No one would argue with this. Some want to blame the government for the cause of our problems in our world today. But at the end of the day, the blame partly lies at the feet of the church, the people of God for the conditions that's going on around us. Think about it. It's been going on for decades, even now. We have ceased to call sin, sin. We have ceased to do what is right. And for the last years, we have stood by silently while the, world, the church has embraced the world's ways and the world's evils. Think about all the things we've allowed to go through because we've kept our voices quiet. Removing a prayer in school. Even just recently, a coach being sued. And, and because he was praying not with the team, but just he himself was leaning down and praying. And they want to take him to court for it. 
Think about this. Uh, the Bible has been removed. You cannot go into a, a courthouse now and do anything that is very godly. Separation of church and state is a good thing. But it also is something that ought not to be in some of the things we see going on in our political arena. Promoting homosexualism, lesbianism, transsexualism, same-sex marriage, arguing over which bathroom to use. And even in our very last Olympics this past summer, we've seen how there was such a, a, a conflict because a transgender wanted to participate in women's swimming and he was winning all the events that rightfully ought to have gone to the women. And so we see this is going on and on. A lot of our own people, a lot of our own people now, Christian folks are living in sin openly and feel no shame about it or sense of wrongdoing. And all the while we stand silently back, allowing all this stuff to go on. And our young people are watching what we are allowing to go on. And they are being taught by our actions. Or should I say, lack of actions. Being committed to God is no longer important. And our children see this. They see us shunning our responsibilities. We have a responsibility and we shun it. And our young people are seeing this and is saying something to their minds. Our young people are watching us saying that church is not important. How do you know if your child thinks church is important or not? If you wake up on Sunday morning and they say, are we going to church today? That means it's not set in your home. That Sunday is the Lord's day. And it's the day that we go to church to worship God. We are teaching our children that evangelism to the lost is no longer important. We no longer are concerned about our family or friends who are dying and going to hell. And we no longer try to reach out and win them to Christ. And then we wonder, why is our church in the shape that it's in? How has it become to the point that we see it in? I tell you, it's time to fight for the family, fight for the home, fight for the church, and fight for the community. If we all fail to stand for what is important today, we may not have a church tomorrow. I see a decline of young people being involved in the ministry of the Lord. I don't see young people loving the Lord as my generation as a child loved the Lord. You see, I look around today and I don't see many people that are in their young years involved in ministries no longer once they graduate high school. Think about all the folks that we have raised up uh, with the mamas and daddies right here and taught them the word of God. And yet, as soon as they graduate high school, we no longer see them anymore. You don't see them sitting among us anymore. They graduate high school and they leave the church. They get out on their own. They're going to do their own thing. While they're living in the home, they're going to do what mom and dad says. But once they reach the independence that they think they have, and they do have. They no longer want to come to church. What is that saying? You know, I'm going to be honest with you. 50 years ago, that seemed like a long time. But that's when I was a child. And some of you were children. Even 60 years ago, 70 years ago, you were children. And you were very involved in the work of the Lord, in the ministry. You become a young adult. You were still involved as I was. And we stayed involved in the ministry. I don't see that happening today. And I'm concerned about it. And we all want to be concerned. We are teaching these children and instructing them. And yet, as soon as they graduate, they leave and we don't see them no more. We need to be concerned about what's going on. We need to wake up and take notice. The two men in our scripture today, we're going to learn of them and one of the things we learned is they didn't do anything that was very dramatic or anything that stood out. In fact, if I was to mention to you Tola and Zaire on the street, you, you wouldn't know who I was talking about, most likely. But what they do is challenge us, nonetheless, to live for the Lord. 
Now what did these two men do? They helped to maintain peace in the midst of turmoil. For nearly 50 years in a nation that has been split apart because of war, rebellion, and pagan worship. And that in itself is no small feat. When there were no attacks from the outside trying to break up the nation of Israel, they helped to prevent the nation from being ripped apart from the inside. As we all know, the devil works many times. If he can't tear a church up from the outside, he'll try to tear the church up from the inside. Theirs was a ministry of peace in the midst of turmoil. Tola and Jair did exactly what we are supposed to do in our day and time. That is remain faithful to God and mentor the next generation to stay stuck on Jesus. Tola and Jair served together consecutively for a total of 45 years. Now look once again in chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. And after Abimelech there arose to defend Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Ishakar, and he dwelt in Shamir and Mount Ephraim. Now, if you were going to name a young child today, I wouldn't suggest this verse to name a child for You don't want to stay away from this verse to name your child. However, he judged Israel 20 and 3 years and died and was buried in Shamir. Tola was a man of humble service. He wasn't boastful. He wasn't proud. He wasn't arrogant. He was a humble servant of God who judged the nation of Israel. He self-surrendered himself and he was a type of the Savior of Israel. Tola reminds us of the Lord in his own humility and that he might die upon the cross of Calvary to save sinners from their sin. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8, it says this, let this mind be in you which also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." And so here is a humble man of God who simply went about day by day judging the nation of Israel, righting right and condemning wrong and simply serving God every day of his life. And there was Jair. Listen to verses 3 and 5 once again. And after him arose Jair, a Gileadite, and judged Israel 20 and 2 years. And he had 30 sons that rode on 30 ass colts, and they had 30 cities which are called Havah Jair unto this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jair died and was buried in Camon. And so we see that this also is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jair was a wealthy man, it would appear, because he had 30 sons. I mean, if you got a bunch of sons, you got to have some money to feed them with. But he gave them all a donkey apiece. He didn't give them a Mustang. Didn't give him a jaguar, as I heard one preacher say, but he gave him donkeys to ride on. But that was extravagant in those days and time, especially to give 30 of them away. But then he also gave them each a city, a city to be able to communicate in. And so he was a wealthy man who gave all 30 some donkeys, also giving son his own city. And this reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ everything and gives all and shares everything he owns with us. Listen to what it says in Romans chapter 8. Romans 8, 16 through 18. The Spirit itself bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so this donkey is associated with peace. 
The horse is associated with war, a war animal. But the donkey was associated with peace. Jair was a man filled with peace and tried to conduct peace in time of turmoil. Jamir, as we learn, had these 30 sons who are ambassadors of peace to the nation of Israel. Well, Jesus also has ambassadors in his kingdom. And that's you and me. Listen to what 2 Corinthians 5.20 says. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. If you were ever a royal ambassador in the Baptist church, you know that verse. That is our key verse that we learned as a child. When we think about Tola and Jair, not being well known, in fact, relatively unobscured, their lives, though, made a difference in thousands and thousands of people throughout the years. Sometimes we think, well, we're not very popular. I'm not going to be able to reach a whole lot of people. The thing is, when you're used of God, God opens the doors. God gives us the talents and the gifts he blesses us with. Many of us, we can't speak in public until the Lord touches us, and then dramatically you're changed. I can testify to that. I never spoke at all. It was a struggle. I was like a statue standing there. But God works in me, and, and I'm still not as prolific as a lot of great preachers. I would love to emulate. But the Lord gives me what he wants me to have to be able to bring across his holy and precious word. Some of you think, well, I can never teach Sunday school or a vacation Bible school class. How do you know? I never knew I could swim until I got in the water. <laughs> And to be honest with you, I couldn't when I started. But I kept on at it until I was able to stay afloat. Many of us may stumble and fumble through scripture and try to teach a lesson, but the more we do it, the more God's grace comes upon us. We simply need to keep doing what God has set before us to do. And whatever that is, he knows. It's his will working through us to reach other people. And listen, we can make a difference in our homes. Grandparents can make a difference in their children. We can make a difference at the workforce. We can make a difference with our coworkers. We can make a difference in the community. We can touch our neighbors. God will give us what we need to reach out and touch them. And you don't have to do a whole lot. Many times when people are grieving, you don't need to say a whole lot. Just show up. Put your arm around them and tell them I'm praying for you. That means more than you'll ever know when people are grieving. Sometimes we don't want to go because we don't know what we can say. Well, don't say anything. Just show up. Let them see that you care. We can make a difference with the men of our church as we have our men's meetings. We can make a difference with the women of our church as they said yesterday, had a wonderful meeting. And we can make a difference with the youth of our church. If we'll just show up and do what we're supposed to do, let go and let God, let him do the rest, he will accomplish his work through us to reach other people. Tola, he was humble. And yet he was a judge. I'm reminded of what James chapter 4 verse 10 says, where it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. You and I can do great things for God when we humble ourselves. We think, well, there's nothing, there's no good in the me, there's nothing I can do that God can use. That's not what the Bible says. We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 27 through 29, these words. But God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen. Yea, and things which are not to bring to note things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. 
God wanted to use Moses. But Moses couldn't be used in his early years because Moses was too proud and arrogant. He thought in his own mind, God had used me in a mighty way and he slew the Egyptian. But he got ahead of God's timing. And he went to that wilderness for 40 years and he become humble. And that's when God can use him. When God called him up to the mountainside and he saw that bush burning yet not being consumed, God said, I want you to go to Egypt and tell that Pharaoh, let my people go. Moses said, well, who am I that I should tell Pharaoh to let him go? 40 years earlier, he'd have told him, I'm the big prince of Egypt. I'll tell him. But now he's humbled. Who am I that I should go? And God says, it's not who you are, it's who I am. You tell them I am and sit you. And so we need to learn how to be humble where God can use us in a mighty way. That's what Tola teaches us. He had the mind of Christ, which was humbleness. But then look at Jair. Uh, one thing about Jair we can say is he brought 22 years of peace to Israel. You'll notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 58, it says this. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Because these two men were faithful, God allowed them to rule the nation of Israel with a time of peace in the midst of turmoil. Notice verse 5 in Judges chapter 10. <clears throat> and Jair died and was buried in Cameron. He went the way of all the earth is what we said. He went the way that you're going to go and you're going to go and, and I'm going to go and and you're going to go. He went the way that we're all going to go. And the only escape from that is the rapture. As long as the rapture is tarrying, we're going to go the way of all the earth. He died. And you and I would die. No matter how rich, no matter how poor. It doesn't matter how powerful or how lowly. It doesn't matter the skin color. It doesn't matter our age or our status in life. Death comes to all of us sooner or later. If you look at the obituaries today, you'll see all manner of ages and all cultures and people of color have passed away. It's going to happen to us. In light of this, we need to be prepared to die. Now, nobody wants to die. I understand that. Some yearn to. They're ready to. But we don't want to go because we miss so much here, but then we want to go because we want to gain so much over there. But in light of the subject of death, we all need to be ready. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it says this, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. You see, there's two appointments we're all going to keep. One is death, and one is the judgment. Are you ready to go? I didn't ask if you wanted to go, but are you ready? Have you made your reservations secure within Jesus Christ? You see, then you can have peace in the midst of turmoil if you're ready to go. If you made your reservations secure by the Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. I want to ask each and every one this question today. If God chose to bring you home today, would you be ready? I didn't ask if you wanted to go, but would you be ready to go? You see, people leave this world in a manner of ways, health issues, accidents, circumstances thrust upon them. Are you ready to go?
If not, I pray that you will consider receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning. Would you come and accept his accomplished work on Mount Calvary for your sin and tell him that you're simply a sinner in need of a Savior? Acknowledge your sin before him. Believe in that he is the very Son of God who died on the cross, was buried in the tomb, resurrected from the dead, has ascended back up to the Father. Confess your sin before him. Confess your faith before men. Would you? He has promised he would save you if you would. For the Bible teaches us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So would you? How's our lives measuring up today? Christian, are we living in the full light of his love? Is there anything that we're ashamed of that we are being a part of that we know we shouldn't be? What are we going to do about it? We're going to continue knowing he is displeased? Or are we going to get it right? That burden you're struggling with, how long are you going to carry it before you give it to the Lord? Would you come today? Listen, there's any number of reasons why we ought to come. We all have loved ones and friends. We don't want to see die and go to hell. We could come and pray for them. That the Lord would give them another opportunity. And that perhaps he could use you to minister to their salvation. Whatever the reason, would you come today? Would you? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. And you care more about us than I believe we'll ever know. I pray that as the Holy Spirit moves upon our hearts and minds, even right now, you would share with us what we need to do. How we would please you in this invitation. Bless us, Lord, and I hope in turn we bless you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. God bless you everywhere you go and may you have influence upon somebody. Amen. God bless you. Hey, Charlie, would you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank the Lord for the word of our today. We just ask that you bless us and bless us in our lives. We pray to your kingdom, Lord. For all requests we make today, we pray to you. Thank you for the blessings you give us each day. We thank you for the blessings you give us each day.